Greetings and welcome back to room 303, the Harvard Classics Lectures. This is lecture number 91. We're going to be looking in a volume, Harvard Classics volume number 26, the Continental Dramas. They provide six of them in this volume. We're going to be looking at Cornell's famous uh, Polycon uh, from 1643. Now, this is, no question, one of the great plays about duty, about loyalty, honor. It tells of the life of the great Christian martyr, St. Polycus. And in many ways, this text will inform our thinking, continue to inform our thinking, on what is often referred to as the conversion experience. You'll remember that in our comments on St. Augustine's Confessions, and you can find those lectures at learnstrong.net elsewhere, that we talked a lot about how St. Augustine spoke about that issue of the conversion experience. One minute I have one view, and then I have a different view. We'll be looking in this play to try to understand why it is the case that a very prominent Roman citizen will decide to break the law and to become a converted Christian. Now, some real brief biography of Pierre Cornell. He's born in uh, June uh, of 1606 and will die October of 1684. A famous French tradition along with um, uh, uh, Moliere, as well as uh, Racine. Uh, we'll be talking about both of those uh, later. Uh, he really kind of completes what is often referred to as the Holy Trinity of 17th century French uh, playwrights. Um, for over 40 years, he writes these amazing plays. In Pocket, we have a great example of the great French classical tragedy. To point out, there's not a lot of action in a play like this, all right? Aristotle's unities of time, place, and action will be, in fact, utilized, but the importance of speech giving will be central to understanding Cornell, and especially in uh, the text Polygon. The drama is going to be set in ancient Armenia, in, uh, uh, in, in a city, uh, Malintin, which is in present-day Turkey, right? During a time when Christians were persecuted there under the Roman Empire, Polycut, Armenian noblemen, is, as we said, going to convert to Christianity. Uh, his wife, Pauline, one of the great creations of Cornell, uh, and, uh, and as well his father-in-law, Felix, are going to have serious problems with this before they themselves ultimately convert at the end of the play. Um, Pauline could, even though he's begged by his wife, uh, Pauline, and his father-in-law, Felix, will decide to become a martyr. Now, this whole thing of martyrdom has a, a, an amazing history. We've spoken about this elsewhere, and you can do your own research. But the idea that you prove your loyalty to the faith by uh, suffering death, and usually some kind of horrific death, um, in the end, the influence of Polycat will convince Pauline and Felix to both convert as well. Now, there is a romantic subplot that we should point out, because we have the Roman Severus, who is in love with Pauline, and she in fact is in love originally with him, and he hopes ultimately that after the conversion of Polyca in his execution that he will get the girl, which ironically um, is the way that it ends up, right? However, in the middle of the play, she decides to stay by her husband's side and to support him, to be loyal to him. Polyca, however, before he dies, does ask his rival Severus if he will take care of his wife, uh, Pauline. Now, as we've said, Polycat uh, is a recent Christian convert who would rather die a martyr than to renounce his new faith. Pauline obviously will plead with him, and the Roman soldier Servius will attempt to save him, but you know nothing, nothing works. After Polycat's execution, Pauline and her father, who in fact executed Polycat, are so blown away by the example of the Christian martyr that they themselves will convert. Now, this is probably Cornell's finest tragedy. He'll use Alexandrian, a really flexible Alexandrian verse. Uh, he has this elegant, symmetrical argument between two opposing forces, the world of the flesh, we might say, represented by the Roman Empire, obviously, and then a spiritual world that so does attract Polycon. The action, right, in this play takes place then in the Roman colony of Armenia. The emperor, Decia, has uh, already said, because of his hating of Christians, that all governors are to enforce his really terrible draconian laws against Christians, and therefore practicing Christianity 
is a capital offense. It is sometimes surprising in the history of Christian um, uh, practice for many Christians today to come to terms with the fact that Christians initially were killed for atheism, a disbelief in the gods, and their behavior was seen as pathological, sociologically uh, disruptive, and that's why they had to be killed. Let's go through the play now quickly at level one. Polycut married to Pauline, who happens to be the daughter of Felix, the Roman governor in Armenia, so a woman of tremendous power, right? Although she loved uh, Sadir, who we'll see later in the play, she gave in to her father's desires. She marries Polycut because at the time Polycut was richer than um, Sadir. Um, however, things have changed now. Sadir is a very influential advisor to King, uh, to the Emperor, uh, to Decia. And Polycut seems kind of like an ordinary person at the beginning of the play, and in fact, that's part of Cornell's point. He is a very ordinary person, right? No one expects any surprises from Polycut. Um, his friend, however, Narku, will persuade him to embrace Christianity, and both Polycut and Pauline will speak of Pauline's reoccurring nightmare. She sees Polycut's death, and she's horrified by it. However, he doesn't take the nightmare seriously. She is clearly terrified. Although, he does want to become a Christian. He doesn't want to anger Pauline, or Felix, obviously, his father-in-law. And they think Christians are seriously contemptible, right? So you have this waffling throughout the play, where Balika is a little bit hesitant to decide, I am going to go ahead and make the conversion uh, uh, official and public as well, right? Obviously, this is a problem for Felix as well as for Severe, as well as for Pauline, right? Should this kind of arbitrary emperor's law against Christianity be enforced when it comes down to somebody like Pauline? At first, Felix thinks he maybe can profit from Polycus' martyrdom and death if Pauline then will turn around and marry now who has become very influential, um, Severe. Pauline will reject, however, this proposal. She vows never to marry Severe. She appeals to Severe's love for her and begs him to intervene. Please help me with my father. Felix, however, is having none of it. He will not give in, and his son-in-law will have to die unless he will rescind this conversion experience. No way he's going to avoid death. He forces Polycut to watch the execution of Polycut's pal, Narakyo, who is, who is killed off stage. However, this doesn't work, doesn't discourage him. The martyrdom only strengthens Polycut's commitment to his new religion, and therefore Polycut himself will be executed. Now, the martyrdom of uh, Polycut unexpectedly affects Felix and Pauline, right? They're moved by his courage. They both, in the end, will convert to Christianity, um, leaving the tragedy at the end, then, with Severe expressing admiration for Christians, and he promises not to persecute them. He believes that Felix and Pauline can serve both God and the emperor. Polycut, of course, a powerful play, right? It explores, with amazing sensitivity, the importance of courage, Loyalty, personal commitment to ethical and religious beliefs. Although Polycut had no intention of converting to Christianity before his conversations with his friend Narku, he comes to realize that his life would have no meaning if he were to deny his faith. He refuses to lose his immortal soul in order to save his life. And although Pauline would have preferred to marry Severe, Polycut is her husband, and she admires his courage to see as well as a representative of loyalty and duty, right? Her love and respect for him made her ready to accept the gift of faith after his execution. Similarly, Felix, displeased, obviously, with his son-in-law, obviously not as skilled as a politician as Severe, but he does recognize the honesty of Polycut in the end, right? Felix's conversion to Christianity, however, has struck many critics as incredible, um, but they can't question really his sincerity. Felix will tell Severe at the end, I made a martyr of Polycon, but his death made me a Christian. 
Um, let's think a little bit about what we qualify as our big five in 303 and how this text speaks to each of those. Epistemologically, as we have said, what we can know, there are three choices. An absolutist position, I am right, you are wrong, no doubt, no question. The opposite of that, there are no truths whatsoever, the relativist position we've pointed out, to say there are no absolutes is to posit an absolute, the performative contradiction. And then there's that thing in between, that epistemological position in between, that in 303 we'll often recognize as being valuable, the fallibilist position, I think I'm right but I could be wrong, it's that I could be wrong part that will make us moderns. Notice in this play though, Polycut will come to the position of absolute faith and will not deviate. There will be no arguments that Pauline or Felix or Father can make that will make Polycut say, you know what, you're absolutely right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to change my opinion, my mind. Ontologically, what does this text say? Well, we are really people, then it's clear, this text suggests, we are people who long for purpose and meaning in our life. And when it's once found, through faith maybe, then it's something that must be held on to regardless of outcome, punishments and the like. Now psychologically this text tells us that the overcoming of fear is a prodigiously difficult thing to do and yet admirable. Sociologically this text says you can't let the group decide for you what it is you're going to ultimately believe in. We think about Emerson's self-reliance, that famous essay. We've given lectures on that at LearnStrong.net as well. He who would be uh, a man must be a non-conformist, right? Finally, and this play has a lot to say about theodicy, this, the question of evil in the world. We have often said that instead of asking when bad things happen, why did this happen to me, learn to ask why did this happen for me. I think the point of this play is that, and what Cornell is trying to argue, is that suffering can be a propedeutic, instructional, didactic, especially as a model for others. Finally, let's finish at level 2A. What's some of the major messages of a text like this? Well, clearly one of those is that you've got to believe in what is right, and you've got to be willing to live that belief, even though there may be all kinds of challenges. At 2B, the rhetorical level of reading, the symbolism of Polycut is powerful. Obviously, there's a bit of irony as well, that Polycut becomes a Christian, and his wife and father-in-law, the very father-in-law who will in fact execute him, themselves ultimately become Christian because of the example. Well, where are we going to go at 3A to find other titles? Well, I, I, there are a whole lot of them, but I want us to, to think a little bit about the challenge of John Proctor at the end of Arthur Miller's Crucible. We've given a full series of lectures on this great play. But think about how at the very end of that play, John Proctor has to make a decision. Am I going to sign that document or am I not? And knowing that if I sign that document, I, I'm free and I don't have to be punished or, or uh, you know, um, um, executed, and refuses to sign the document. That is to say, he's a martyr, right? Um, but he's a martyr for maybe a little bit different reason from Polygon. And yet, the challenge to do something that many on the outside see as somehow not sacred, but profane. Why would you leave your wife and children alone, et cetera, et cetera? Of course, he will argue it's his reputation, right? For Polycut, it's his soul. At 3B, finally, how can we relate to this personally? What was a time when you had to stand up for what you believed in to be right, and you were not treated well, maybe even persecuted because of it, and a time that you got through that, or a time you watched somebody else stand up for something they believe strongly in. And that was enough to, con to convert you, if we can use the, that, that language, the conversion experience, to change the way you think and, uh, and make you see things differently. Well, I hope this conversation will lead you to study into a viewing of Cornell's great, great classic. Thank you.